This is the Catholic Wire. The church would get to where they were constantly asking for money. Eventually they asked to see their tax records. And every time I went to these religions, every one of them was saying, this man created this religion on this year. I get to the Catholic Church and it says, the Catholic Church was created by Jesus Christ. I said, I'm not going to be Catholic anymore. But for whatever reason, I couldn't take that scapular off. He was hit and we said, what were the chances? And the doctor looked at him and goes, there weren't any. He goes, I've never once in my life seen this. In the last decades, many Catholics have experienced terrible moral persecution. Their faith, their traditions, were taken away from the churches. Many have lived for many years ignorant of the deprivation they suffered. Some are still going through that painful and at once beautiful process of rediscovering the Catholic faith. For the encouragement of those still in that journey, faithful Catholics have shared with us their challenges trials, and blessings. This is the story of their journey, Back to the Faith. Yeah. Hello and welcome to another episode of Back to the Faith in the Catholic Wire. This is your host, Father Carlos Cepeda, and I'm joined today by Angie, who's going to tell us the story of her conversion to the faith. Thank you so much for joining us, Angie. Thank you, Father. Glad to be here. So, um, where are you from? How, uh, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Southern California, uh, just uh, a few blocks from Disneyland. Um, used to see the fireworks and at, at night and um, kind of right in the middle of everything out there. Mm -hmm. Did you grow up Catholic? Um, I was baptized Catholic at one of the missions, San Gabriel Mission. Um, mm -hmm. And at that time, my father was Catholic and he brought my mother into the faith. Um, he had been an altar server and uh, a part of the church. Uh, when my parents both started going, the church would get to where they were constantly asking for money. Uh, it was Vatican II. Mm -hmm. And they'd be bugging them about money all the time. And eventually they asked to see their tax records because they wanted to make sure they were tithing enough. And at that point, my mother said, nope, that's it. I'm not going to have the church looking into my tax records. There's no reason for this. They're, all they do every week is ask me for money. And they both left the faith at that point. That was when my mother decided she didn't want to have any part to do with any religion. Mm -hmm. um, she was just disgusted with the whole thing. And she started sending me to just a private generic Christian school. Mm -hmm. And at that point, she decided she would allow me to grow up and decide what faith I wanted to be. She wasn't going to try to push anything onto me. Mm -hmm. She was open to whatever I wanted to do, whether it was Christianity or anything else. It was just what I would decide to do when I grow up. Mm -hmm. What a great, uh, what great damage comes from those kind of things. That That's kind of crazy that they asked you for your tax records. Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it was apparently quite often that she was just, Yikes. that she was disgusted with the whole thing. Do you know kind of what year that happened? Um, uh, that was the early to mid 70s. So right after Vatican II. Yeah. yeah. And that was just the only impression she had was that they were just constantly, hang, you know, asking for money. Mm -hmm. And I had a very negative views of the Catholic faith at that point. And mm -hmm. if this is during your teenage years, this was my upbringing. Yeah. All the mm -hmm. way through my teenage years. And I detested it. I didn't want anything to do with it. And every time I went around for anything with my family, if they showed any sign of being part of a religion, I didn't want anything mm -hmm. to do with it. I was very counter to it just because the oh. poor examples that they all showed. And mm -hmm. I wanted nothing 
to be part of it. But at that point in high school, uh, I had I wanted a faith. I wanted to be part of something, mm-hmm. and I just didn't know what, except for I knew it wasn't going to be Catholic. Mm-hmm. And I would attend different churches. My friends would invite me mm-hmm. to go to church on Sunday with them to wherever, and I was open to anything. I was really I, I was whatever it was. I didn't care. I would go, and I went to things like Calvary Chapel, and you know they'd be singing and playing their guitars and doing all that. And mm-hmm. I was like, this just doesn't feel right. And I go to the next thing and, and they would welcome me in there and be, you know, very, very nice, but it just never felt right. None of them ever felt this is what the faith should be. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't continue with any of them. Mm-hmm. Felt like a human institution, maybe something too human. Yeah, just it, 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 it didn't. Yeah, it felt the, the singing and the, the hand-holding and all that, it just didn't, it felt for show. It Mm -hmm. didn't feel like there was anything of faith. I never felt, wow, I feel closer to God. Mm -hmm. Never did I ever feel like that. And so Mm -hmm. I just kept going on and I was happy not doing anything on Sundays and sleeping in and, you know, not having (laughs) any responsibility, you know, whatsoever and anything towards God. It, It just was very generic for me at that point. Yeah. Did you believe in God at that time? Did that ever like cross your mind or, or were you like uh, uneasy about that? Or is it just something that really didn't took a priority at that time, if I may ask? Of course. Yeah, no, it, at that time, because I remember specifically in high school being asked a lot, like what faith I was. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they wanted to categorize me in it, but I would say I'm Christian and they go, oh, what denomination? I'm just Christian. And I wouldn't go past that. And it wasn't a lack of wanting to. It was just I didn't know where mm-hmm. I belonged. What, what, And I didn't even really truly know what that meant. Mm-hmm. I just knew I had gone to a Christian private school growing up. But we, never, we didn't do anything. Like in my household, we didn't pray. We didn't do anything at all that was pro-religion or pro-faith or... It was just, okay, yeah, I believe there is a God. Past that, I really don't know. And I was just trying to, I was open to seeking it out, but I didn't actively. It was just, if somebody put it in front of me, then I would do it. But I didn't actively seek anything out. Mm -hmm. How did you end up, uh, tell us the whole story of how you ended up becoming Catholic. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I had, um, at that point, you know, just trying to attend things, still having, um, I was just starting adulthood Mm -hmm. and my grandmother had, uh, passed away Mm -hmm. and, um, it was right that it was like maybe a day or two before she passed away. I had had a dream and I don't put that, you know, everything should be put into necessarily a dream, you know, but it was, it was something that kind of was a catalyst for getting me to where I was. Mm -hmm. And in that dream, I can remember specifically, I was driving down a a freeway in California at night and uh, all of a sudden the cars, all the cars disappeared. And I was standing in the middle of the freeway. Everybody was. And everybody was just kind of looking around, not knowing what was, what was going on. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it was, it was dead silent. It was eerily silent. And suddenly I look up and you see things falling from the sky and everyone without saying anything realized it was angels coming to collect souls that deserve to be collected. Mm -hmm. And these angels started coming down and everybody just dropped on their knees and started praying for God's forgiveness. And um, that was where my dream ended was I just got on my knees and I was praying And I never had a dream like that before nor after anything even similar, nothing at all in that type of context. And it really had an impact on me. And I thought something, it's God's wanting me to search something out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what at that point still. And I'm, but I felt compelled. Just, it was just such a, a weight on me that I was like, I have to find out why this is happening and I have to go somewhere. And, um, so at that point, my book within a day or so, my grandmother died. And I didn't know if they had any connection mm-hmm. whatsoever. And uh, I had, I, I don't recall now which, 
happen first. But during that time, I know she did have um, a, a cap. It was a Vatican II priest at her funeral. And I felt like, okay, I need to talk to someone. I need someone spiritual guidance. And so when I went to a funeral night, I tried reaching out to that priest. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, wanting to know, you know, to, to kind of connect here. And he couldn't, he didn't have time for me. He wouldn't, he didn't, he was like, I've got to go somewhere. I have a meeting. Didn't try saying here, here's my phone number. Contact me in the future. Let's, let, you know, let's reach out. Nothing. No, you just, I don't have time for that right now. And he left. And I was disgusted with that. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm trying to, you know, kind of figure this out. So during that same time, all this was happening, I was working with my uncle um, for my, we worked for my father and um, my uncle would be reading all the time. Every day he'd order the, the books, one of those mail order places for books. And, okay. and he would read, even though he was like I said, very poor example for a Catholic. He would read books on religion all the time, and he would be reading the Bible every day. And I'd watch him every single day, devout, he'd be reading. And so at this point, it was all within that same time frame. I'm like, okay, I really need to narrow this down and figure out. And I and that priest left a bad taste in my mouth. And, um, and my, my uncle had this one book he had just ordered, and it was, um, it was a generic book on all religions. So he, mm -hmm. at that point, I don't think he was even really practicing any type of Catholicism. I think he was just kind of going, uh, trying to read up and find out about different things, but reading the Bible mm -hmm. in that point. But this book, um, it, it wasn't brought out. It was a generic Christian book. It, so, you know, the big thing was it wasn't a Catholic book that was put out. And mm -hmm. he had it there, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to figure out what religion I'm going to be from this book. That was the best I had was on me was figuring it out. So I, I grabbed, it was a big, it was a thick book. I have no idea what it was at this point, but it was a big book. And I started just flipping through it reading and I'd read about this particular religion. And it said, you know, man created, this man created this religion in this year. Okay. So I flipped the page and the next one, this man created this religion in this year. All right. No, it doesn't seem interesting. You know, that nothing was sparking my interest. So I kept doing it. And every time I went to these religions, every one of them was saying, this man created this religion on this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is, I, and I, even, even then not knowing anything, I felt that was completely wrong. I'm like, who gave these men this power to create these religions? That doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. How, what gave you the right, you know, to go ahead and say, I'm going to create my own religion. And it made no sense to me whatsoever. So defiantly, I was like, okay, if these are all saying this, I'm going to see to prove that Catholic church wrong. I'm going to see what it says under the Catholic church one. And it was zero intent of ever trying to, to go to the faith. And mm -hmm. I just thought, I'm going to go ahead and just prove it, you know, that, I'm, I'm right to mm -hmm. despise the Catholic Church. So I go ahead and I open it up and I read to what the Catholic Church says. So after reading this man, this man, this man, I get to the Catholic Church and it says, the Catholic Church was tr created by Jesus Christ. Oh, are you <laughs> kidding me? I was so upset and angry. I'm like, that's not right. <laughs> How could that be? The Catholic Church created by Jesus Christ not by just an any mortal man and being a person that does believe that Jesus Christ is the right head of our faith, not mm -hmm. knowing really all that it you know, does. I realized at that point, I can't argue that. There's no arguing it. And mm -hmm. I, as much as I wanted to fight it at that point, I knew I kind of given up. I'm like, but I, and I didn't know how at that point to kind of reconcile it because I'm like, I saw the ugliness in the church of what was going on and with my uncles and, you know, with, with the way they were. But then I read, it was created by Jesus Christ. So I'm like, I was done arguing that fact that of who, what was the correct religion, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what to do with the information at that point and what to do, how to go from there. And I really was 
upset about the whole thing because I'm like, I can't argue that. They're, they're, no one gave man the right, and I can't argue this one's created by Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of let it, let it sit. And at that point, I was uh, already dating my my future husband. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do I do with this? And I'm and we started at that. We started at that. I think at that point we were getting engaged or had been engaged. And I said, If I may ask, yes. where, where was he at religiously? Um, he, he, his parents raised him um, in the church, but he had fallen away. At one point, he had considered becoming a priest, mm -hmm. um, but he was disgusted with everything. And his parents had sent his siblings to a Vatican II school, and he saw what happened to them. And he's like, I don't want to be part of it and they would attend every once in a while but mm -hmm. his parents knew the church wasn't doing the right thing and so basically everybody kind of stayed away mm -hmm. and so he wasn't practicing in any way but he did believe in the church but just not the way the church was going he just he was kind of lost disappointed at the church you could say yeah mm -hmm. and just kind of going on his life but he knew he had to be part of the faith he mm -hmm. just wasn't doing anything because he didn't know what to do at so he, that point. He was kind of like in the same position that you were in a certain way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was, it was definitely a, a loss right there. We, you know, we just didn't know where mm -hmm. to go. And um, so I, I told him when we talked about getting married, I said, well, we're going to have to get married outside. I go, I'm not getting married in that church. I go, that's not going to happen. And he's like, I understand. And so we were, we were kind of at that point. And uh, it was soon after, it was right before uh, Easter of 95 at this point. And mm -hmm. my mother-in-law invited me because it was Easter, even though she wasn't going to church on Sundays. She's like, it's Easter. We go to church. So she invited me to go to the Novus Ordo church in town. Mm -hmm. And I was... Um, I wasn't going to say no to my future mother-in-law and I went in there and it was just so bizarre because really I think it was all the grace of God on how I was guided because I didn't know, I didn't know what the true things were, but I knew what was wrong. I knew what mm -hmm. felt wrong. And so when we went in there, it was a packed church, Novus Ordo. There were no kneelers. Women were dressed immodest no head coverings. And I'm like, I don't even know where I knew head coverings were supposed to be worn in church, but I knew. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, this doesn't feel right. And then they had um, altar girls dressed in white with tennis shoes on. And they were running down the aisles with streamers going, and they were going up and down the aisles. And I was like, and I felt so wrong. I just felt like I'm not, I, I just wanted to get up and go. But like I said, we were, it was a packed church. We were stuck in the middle of the pew. I would have had to get up and I was worried about offending my future mother-in-law by getting up. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, the, the thing being sent down for everybody to make a donation. I'm like, here's a dollar and I'm never coming back. You know what I'm like? <laughs> I was just, I, I knew it wasn't right. It just felt completely wrong. And I, I don't ask there. me for my tax. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was just, exactly. Don't ask me for any more money than that. You're, that's all you're getting out of me. And uh, so it was right when we left, I told my, my future husband, I said, there's no way. I go, I'm not. This is, I go, that, I don't know what it, what it, and I told him. I said, I don't know what it's supposed to be, but I know this isn't it. And mm. I know this is wrong. And he's like, he was disgusted. And I, the funny thing was, I never mentioned, because I never wanted to offend my my mother-in-law. And so I didn't mention anything. And about four years ago or so, you know, that we were talking and she goes, you know, remember that time we went to the, that Nova Soda church and, you know, for Easter. And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, do you know what I never told you? And I go, what? And she goes, I wanted to get up and walk out, but I didn't want to offend you. This was my mother-in-law uh, telling me this. And I said, no way. I go, that was me. I didn't want to offend you. So here both of us were thinking the same exact thing, but neither of us wanted to offend the other one. So we just stuck it out, but both swore we were never going to go back there again. That reminds me of this uh, video that I saw of the, I think it's put out, it's, it's, it's on YouTube. And you had this packed church, and I don't know what they're celebrating, but they bring uh, a Hare Krishna band. And you see the guys come up all the way in the sanctuary and they're like singing Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna for like 30 minutes. 
and everybody's just sitting there, nobody's moving. You know, I, I think of that mm -hmm. as like everybody's face is so confused. They're all just thinking like, I want to get out of here, but nobody does. You know, they're yeah, all, they because, don't want to be offending. Yeah, yeah, and the Hare Krishna people are, are walking and singing around the pews. So it's like, there's no way you can even get out without making a huge, you know, scene, mm -hmm. I guess. And it just reminded me of that because I felt so bad. Just watching the video is so uncomfortable uh -huh. to see how loud it is and, and obnoxious. And and that, that kind of stuff happens a lot. There was another lady in Mexico that told me that this was what, what threw them out of the church, so to speak, what, what uh, pushed them out. So one day they, they came to the church and they put screens next to the pews and uh, they started playing this really eerie new age music and showing, you know, like pictures of nature and stuff like mm -hmm. during mass. And she was like, this is, this is from the devil. Like this is, there's nothing from God in this. Mm -hmm. And after that, she, she walked out. But you were, you were, continue your story. You were telling us about what, what happened afterwards. Um, yeah, so my in-laws, my, my father-in-law went to this new, the, the traditional church mm -hmm. and um, he immediately knew this was what he grew up with. And he had been an altar server. My mother-in-law was in the choir. Um, and that's where they met. And they both immediately felt a connection. So, so they told my husband what, uh, that they found out that there was the church out in Southern California. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I mentioned the name. Yeah. Uh, so Father Dominic's Church of Queen of Angels. And mm -hmm. they said, you know, go check it out. And um, this was within like two weeks, I think, of something like that from that Easter, uh, going to that other one. Okay. And so they said, there, it's a small little chapel. And, you know, the um, we don't know, it's, a, you know, in Santa Clarita. And, it, and it, the way they explained it, I kind of expected something a little more like what you, because uh, they said you got to go out for the bathrooms behind and everything. I was expecting something from like Mexico, you know, where you yeah. go, you know, like Tijuana <laughs> and you have, you're outside and, you know, and go in a dirt hole or something. And I'm like, yeah. and it was um, cooler during that time. And I was like, okay, do I need to wear something really warm? I go, is there going to be heat or anything? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we went, uh, my husband had gone first and um, he, he checked it out because I was busy because he lived in uh, northern LA County and I was still out in Orange County and this was yeah in between but I couldn't make it to to go to that particular mass so he went and he called me and he's like you know this this seems like the real thing you know he and he goes you know go and, and check it out we'll go next Sunday and I was like all right you know I was skeptical but I'm like okay I'll, you know go and um Queen of Angels beautiful little chapel they have heat and air conditioning so i was <laughs> pleasantly surprised with that and i get in there you know and they had the chapel veils there and you know and i was told dress modest and um and wasn't like i i don't even know anymore how back then i don't i don't think i dressed really necessarily on modest but who knows i was in the world mm -hmm. and um so i go in there and i met father and when he started telling me, you know, because Xavier was telling, my husband was telling me these stories about how uh, the priest had, you know, he knew how to fly in a helicopter. He knew how to, you know, scuba dive. He knew did this. I'm like, you're lying. Like, a priest <laughs> don't do things. Like, <laughs> you know, they like, just pray all day. What are they going to do? They don't do anything fun. And so we meet this young priest and I'm like, oh, that doesn't seem right. You know, I was very skeptical of the whole thing because he just, he was, he was really young at the time. And I'm like, this is, uh, you know, really? That's a priest? You know, they're old men. And, um, what was he like 40 years old at the time? He was probably, yeah, probably about 40 or so, but yeah. it was, you yeah, know, he was just, it was so funny because my, my perception and not having been really around except for the Novus Order ones, mm -hmm. you know, it was, um, it, it, yeah, he blew me away. And so he was very, very pleasant, of course, like father always is. And I get into the church and I put the head covering on and, you know, and it's such a quaint little chapel and. I went through one mass and I never, I had, you know, I had zero idea, of course, what was happening, mm -hmm. but everything felt right. And I never, as many, you know, the dozens of churches I had been to in between never felt right. And immediately on the first time I was so excited and elated. And I was, I, I called Xavier and I said, you know, this, this feels really good. You know, this is really neat. 
And father, I think it was right after that mass had brought out one of his books. He's got books on pictures of things that Novus Ordo churches and the so-called popes do. And, and he was showing me and I'm like, yeah, you know, I believe all that, but I didn't know really, you know, any of the differences, you know, Mm -hmm. at that point of what was going on. And, And it felt finally a belonging and it just a comfort. And it was how everybody presented themselves there and the holiness that fell in there. And it was the whole faith of it. There wasn't any, you know, the banjos playing, there wasn't any dancing down the hall. It was all very reverend, everything. And with the women with the head coverings, I'm like, this feels, you know, the right thing, being the modest dress, being the kneelers, everything. And that was the very first time I ever walked out of a, a church feeling like this is the right thing. And, um, it was, you know, that Sunday we just, we started going back, you know, immediately. Mm. And it was, it was a huge adjustment because I can't tell you how many Fridays I'd be mid bite. And I'm like, dang it. <laughs> now I can't finish my hamburger. You know, I'd be so disappointed. I'm like, why? And how many Sundays I'd wake up and go, Oh, I got to get up again. I'm, I'm too tired for this. I don't get to sleep in. I don't think know how hard I work. <laughs> I shouldn't have to commit myself, but it took a lot of adjustment, but finally mm-hmm. got there. And, um, Father, I think it was, I don't, um, it was pretty early on and he asked me, you know, what brought me, mm-hmm. brought me there. And I told him about the the dream and the book and, and he goes, can I use that? He goes, I want to tell, uh, you know, the catechism classes, mm-hmm. uh, the confirmation classes, you know, he goes, I'd like to use that story. And at the very first, uh, class he had to go through there, he had me get up and talk about it when I was going through my classes to get confirmed. And he, I don't know if to this day, if he still uses that, but he loved the story of, you know, Mm -hmm. the generic book bringing me into the faith. And I was, I, you know, I'm so grateful if it does, if it did at that time, help anybody else out knowing, you know, the, the obvious to me. And, and that's the one thing that always baffled me is anyone who sees this, how incredibly obvious it was to me, how Mm -hmm. could it not be? To other people, you know. How could you choose to be in the church that was founded by a man? Yes, exactly. And who gave them that right? (laughs) You know, who who gave that anybody, you know, yeah, you know more than Jesus Christ. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It it shouldn't be allowed. Any man could decide, I don't like this rule of the church, so I'm going to go ahead and create whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And so it's just blatantly obvious to me. So it kind of baffles me. When I see other people and no matter how hard things have become for us over the years, which we've, we've dealt with loss of a child, you know, loss of our house, uh, you know, uh, cancer and kidney transplant. I mean, it's just been a lot of struggles and there's been times I I had really bad postpartum depression with one of my uh, children and you know, I, I, as soon as father gave me that first scapular, I always put it on, I had it on. And there was one, I remember right after giving birth, it was like two days after giving birth. And I was just, I was melting. I I just couldn't, I couldn't keep my senses with me. And I was in the the driveway and I was crying and I said, that's it. I'm not going to be, there's too many struggles. I'm not going to be Catholic anymore. This is it. You know, I'm not, I'm done with it. I, I don't think God is helping me, you know, God's help. And I, I put my foot down and I said, I'm not going to be Catholic anymore. But for whatever reason, I couldn't take that scapular off. And I was like, I can't do it. And even though I was like, that was it. And it was, it was like a momentary feeling. I think it was maybe a day of, you know, just a complete meltdown. And I said, but I could not take it off. And I, I told Father Dominic, I said, I don't, you know, something just holds me in and gives me that strength that why I'm so done with it all. Mm-hmm. How did I not have, you know, the ability to just take it off? And I thought, you know, I'm definitely felt in a good way tethered to yeah. my faith that it's allowed me even through the hardest times uh, to keep going because Without it, I don't think I could have gone through. We had 
on our 15 year anniversary is when we buried our little boy on the actual day. And I thought, you know, without my faith, if I, if God had given me uh, a vision to see where, what we would be going through all these years, you know, I, I don't know how I would choose the life I did, but he's given me the strength mm -hmm. through everything to mm -hmm. keep going. And, you know, and he, he's blessed me with, uh, a terrible memory on most things that I'm able to like forget the painful parts and, you know, things can bring it back, but I'm able to kind of just, okay, yeah, that, that happened. This is not what I would choose, but I can go ahead and, and move on mm -hmm. from there. You made a really good point that, that is, I always find really interesting how the, the real religion, you know, the Catholic religion, the true mass is so against anything that is, humanly entertaining, it, it, like it's all supernatural because, it's, and God is like that. God usually does things like that. It's like, I'm going to do it in such a way that it's very clear that this is my work and not the work of men. Every other religion that you go, yes, the guy in front is there to entertain you. You know, they do the mm -hmm. preaching for 30 minutes and they have to preach very, 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 very <laughs> well because it's like, you're the only thing that there, that there is. Uh -huh. And they have the huge choir and, you know, you go to the concerts of the... Uh, the charismatic people and they have all these concerts where people are raising their hands and feeling a lot of stuff and being blown up by lasers and speakers <laughs> and all that uh -huh. and you go to the latin mass and it's like there's nothing to feed your senses there is if you have a nice big mass you know like with the high choir and everything but in a low mass there's nothing to feed your senses it's all faith 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 and nothing but faith mm -hmm. and and the interesting thing is that, that you get that, your soul gets that feeling of, of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. they, they say something very interesting that the soul, you know how we have certain instincts where if you're, for example, in the woods and there's a predator, you actually feel it. Mm -hmm. You kind of get the feeling something is watching me, like your, your instincts feel the predator, the fear. The deer, for example, they'll feel the, the predators. And they say that the same thing happens, the same thing happens with the soul and the devil. Like when the devil makes himself present, the soul feels fear. And the same thing happens with God. When God is made present in a very particular way, as in the Blessed Sacrament, you feel it. And I, I experienced this one time I remember very particularly because I lived in the monastery for eight years. And you, you had this certain peace. You know, like you're happy, like, like, oh, like, like you say, you know, this is my home, like I'm in a good place. For some reason, I had to go home for a couple of weeks, I think. And I remember that I felt so bad. I was like, something is missing. Like, this is just, I don't feel right. You know, I, I feel like there's a big empty, emptiness. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, this is a blessed sacrament. At home, I didn't have, obviously, the blessed sacrament. And I was used to living with the blessed sacrament for eight years. And I didn't know what it was. But my soul felt that, that peace, that comfort of being, you know, next to our Father, next to, to God. And I think that's what a lot, of, a lot of people feel when you go to Mass. A lot of people, newcomers even, as soon as they enter, they realize there's something different here. Mm -hmm. There's something that is, I can't tell what it is, but it's, there's something different. You reminded me also of one priest that told me once, uh, this was my father superior, actually, he said, if at the beginning of my priesthood or in my vocation, God had told me all that I was going to suffer, I would probably have chickened out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, as you say, you know, little by little, yes, I can take it. But if uh -huh. at the beginning he had told me you're going to go through all of this, I would have been like, no way. Uh, yeah. and that's a good point that you make, too, because it is interesting. Yeah, sure. I know that the sufferings, they seem unbearable at the time and and it, it keeps you know thing things keep happening and i yeah it was really difficult getting through mm -hmm. everything all the all the crosses that were there but i could say you know at least i i always put everything in that if i didn't have my faith i couldn't have mm -hmm. because i know i i would have I would have lost it. I would have 
probably done some, you know, like during certain times, because I, I remembered before I found the faith, there was some, you know, loss that it doesn't even bother me today. But I was I was feeling the loss of something and so yeah. upset that I thought, man, I could just drive my car into that wall, you know, off the highway. Mm -hmm. And that was a thought that went in my head and it was nothing, you know, and all these years later, you know, doesn't bother me in the slightest. But because I have my faith, you know, it strengthens me that, you know, I got to do these things. Going through cancer, I was, uh, I had uh, stage three cancer and mm -hmm. that was a, a huge struggle going through that. I had, uh, my youngest was only a year old and, uh, you know, at the time, you know, there were six children, all very young. And, uh, you know, at that point I would have been fine mentally if mm -hmm. God took me right then. But it also gave me the strength to say, I got to do this for my family. You mm -hmm. know, I can't, I've got to be strong and fight this for mm -hmm. them. And at, you know, at one point I, I, I was very close to being gone, you know, but I, it was the strength of, I have to be here. And that, you know, this all happened for a reason. God did this for whatever reason. And, you know, and I, I have, I've learned a lot about, you know, my ability, my strength to be able to go on and, you know, and appreciate now, because when I, when I was at my lowest, I remember just crying, thinking, I can't even, I can't contribute at all to my household because I was so sick. I mm -hmm. couldn't get up out of bed or do anything. And I couldn't even clean, and big thing that stuck in my head, I couldn't clean my counters. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I have no strength to clean my counters. And that was a big thing to me at that time is because it was such a simple task anybody can do. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't physically do it. And so the fact now that I can do and, you know, go on for hours and hours in a day doing physical labor, mm -hmm. it blows me away from where I was five years ago. That I was like, I didn't think that was at all possible. So I can appreciate now mm -hmm. those things. And I, you know, I thank God, you know, God, I have my health, you know, I can, I can go on, I can take care of my family, be there for my family. And now I appreciate those mundane, mundane tasks that at the time I was like, oh, every day is the same. I have to, you know, clean up <laughs> after these kids, clean up after my husband, do these things that, you know, you can't, you know, it's hard to appreciate unless you put it in the correct context. But now, I can go back and yeah, you know, those kids made a mess again, or my husband did this and made a mess and I can go back and say, okay, I'm grateful. Thank you, God. You know, I'm here. I can do this. And this is my mm -hmm. vocation in life to be able to do these things. How long did that struggle last? With the cancer? Mm -hmm. It was uh, six months of treatments. It was a very uh, aggressive form mm -hmm. of cancer. Um, the doctors, it had spread at that point. I had five lumps and it had spread. Uh, it was uh, all the way on one side of the body, including in my chest and where they couldn't get to it specifically. Mm -hmm. And um, they had to give me extreme uh, doses of chemo that just wore me out. So at that point I had to have, uh, in order to function, to be able to get out of bed, I had to have six hours of uh, fluids, IV fluids given to me four days a week. Otherwise I couldn't even get out of bed. Um, and this went on, it was, they had to finally reduce it cause it was hitting me so bad where I wasn't physically able to do anything. Um, mm -hmm. so they had to reduce it, uh, and give me a little less, but they said that, um, it, it was, it was so severe that I, it could have possibly taken me. And, you know, it was, it was a big struggle, especially having such little ones mm -hmm. at, at home. I had two, uh, two little ones that weren't in school yet. And, uh, their big sister would have to take one of them and keep her on her lap during school at, oh. um, and you know, while they were teaching and the other one was driving the sisters nuts and you know, <laughs> talking, laughing in the Bishop's face, which was totally humiliating. Um, you know, they, everybody kind of, you know, the family really had to step up and it was a struggle for all my family, you know, dealing with it because mom wasn't able to cook and clean and, you know, take care of the little ones at the time. And, um, that was really hard. And, and my husband, he, his employer was trying to accommodate as much as they could. And so they let him 
stay home to take care of me during the day. And then when the kids would come home, the big kids, he would go into work and work till like midnight. And this was seven days a week, even through Easter. And oh. he'd be working every day. And he ended up, uh, I was about 10 months in, um, he finally, he thought he was having a heart attack and up and just quit his job right then and there because he thought it was killing him. Mm -hmm. And so then we had to deal with, I'm just recovering. And then he was unemployed for six months. And that was, it was from one cross to another cross. And it was the year, uh, the year before that was right when I lost my little boy. Mm -hmm. And then the year right before that, I lost my mother. And so, you know, they always say, you know, God gives you what you can handle and he's preparing you. He's teaching you lessons and preparing you. So I was very worried the next year. I'm like, what is God <laughs> preparing me for if I have to have all these things happen? I go, what's going to get worse than, you know, cancer and the job loss and, you know, all that. And, and instead he, you know, we went through these extreme uh, crosses, you know, where I didn't, you know, we, the government assistance isn't enough when you're unemployed. You know, mm -hmm. we barely made it through all that with keeping what we had and went from that to where I think we were at our lowest point to now, you know, we were able to get a much nicer neighborhood house, bigger house where we're very comfortable. And I try not to ever take that for granted mm -hmm. that God gave us all this, you know, we prayed and prayed for years, eight years. We prayed for mm -hmm. a house that we have now. And I'm like, okay, you know, God made me, I'm like, if I look at back at the suffering, you know, okay, just don't, you know, I, I try not to be over enthusiastic. It's, it's a material thing because mm -hmm. I, I don't want anything to happen, but I'm, it's just grateful for what, where I'm at. I was very happy when we moved, well, when, when you moved and we were in the seminary and, and we helped <laughs> over there. And uh, and I remember that, the, you know, the change from one house to the other. And the, the other house was absolutely, I don't know how you would say it, but if you had to put, if I had to put it in numbers, I would say the other, the other house was one and the other house was maybe four times better or five times better or 10 times better. I don't know, but it was way, way better. And just getting in there, moving the stuff, even though it was in our house, we were so happy for you guys just to see <laughs> that. Wow, this is... The basement is here. Look at the, the attic. I don't remember the attic, but, you know, the top the floor upstairs, and, yeah. and all the, the flooring and everything was just great. And, you know, that that's a good point. You know, you have those this prosperity, but now you're detached from it to a certain extent because yeah. it's like, you know, well, at any time, you know, it can be lost and that's not the most important part. I'll enjoy it. Yes. Well, I have it. Be grateful. I'm grateful <laughs> yeah. for what I have, but I try not to, not in a worship status of, you know, okay. this is, is, you know, so great. And I, I try to keep that, but the, definitely the sacrifices were there because the old house for perspective of people who don't know my old house, the old house was 968 square feet, one mm. and a half bedroom, one bathroom. And there was eight of us mm -hmm. for eight years and through my cancer, everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you put six children in a half bedroom <laughs> which they did. We had just bunk bags, you know, stacked up. And it, it's it's a, a huge cross to to live in, you know, such things. But I was always trying to keep it in perspective, no matter how frustrating it was not having any space and not having a second bathroom, especially when I was so sick and really needed it, was, you know, we could be in another country where they don't have even this. And I would always try to keep that in perspective. And we went from that to out of town um and that the the house now is three thousand square feet five bedroom and three bathroom so yeah. it was just yeah it was night and day yeah definitely. night and day difference but i'm just so grateful and i don't think i would have had if we had just moved straight into that i wouldn't have been realizing how much of a gift it is just for mm -hmm. that that comfort level and and no to be praying for eight years for that, because it was really difficult on me when I saw other families, you know, this family buying this big, you know, house and having this and that one and all that. And I was like, God is making me suffer for some reason. And I think, you know, at the times we live in, we don't know what is coming up. And, you know, we always try to be prepared and say, OK, you know, this could be just a fleeting thing that we have this, but we know what it's like to do without. 
Mm-hmm. And that is, I think, the greatest lesson is because God made it that we had to deal without everything. Mm-hmm. We had to, to scrimp and save. We had, you know, when he was unemployed for six months, we didn't have any money. I mean, people were donating toilet paper to us because we couldn't afford those things. And, you know, when you have absolutely nothing, you know, through Christmas, we didn't have money to go buy anything, do anything like that. Mm-hmm. And now I can appreciate and realize, okay, I know how to live without those things. And I can have that detachment mm-hmm. from the from things like that. And I see um, who's a 33rd degree Mason. And, you know, after being Catholic, and that one, hey, yeah, that's a whole other thing. But him, he's got, you know, big, huge house that we call the Pink Castle on top of a hill in L.A. And his, is, you know, house is worth a million dollars. And he's like, well, how do you live? You know, don't you ever just want, you know, to leave your faith and just so you can have all these things, you know, you always, you know, have your faith and uh, look where you are. And he goes, and look where I am. You know, I have this and I have that. And I'm like, you do, you do have that. And I go, and I've sacrificed, you know, I sacrificed me working full time and raising the, you know, kids and not getting, yeah, my kids don't have the latest electronics. My kids don't have these, you know, expensive things. We don't put the kids in, you know, sports and stuff we sacrifice but i wouldn't trade it i would not trade that because i would never want to trade my kids Mm -hmm. to have any of those material things and to be away from them that they were raised by a daycare or the public schools or anything like that that is not even it's not even a consideration Mm -hmm. and you know he has this abundant house that it was like it's him and his wife and it's bigger than our house (laughs) like you don't need this you have this really nice pool you don't need it but yet you've given your soul you've traded it to the devil you know you've you've, you've, he's given he's uh, traded it for the masonic temple that is not i i you know i go yeah you might be getting your physical reward here but when you die what's going to happen I go, that's where I'm at. And I've, I've had those conversations with him where he's just put me down about that, put me down about being a stay-at-home mom, about having more than two children. I had a boy and a girl. What else could I want? You know, those, those kind of things. And I've had to deal with that mm-hmm. of, you know, a, a disapproving family of us, you know, and how many children we've had. And all. and it's nothing compared to, you know, you see in the church how many you know, larger families, but it was, it was very hard to kind of go counter to what the family expects from us. Yeah. And I was going to say your children definitely have fun. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They don't need all the material things. We try our best. (laughs) I was there in the seminary when they were in school and, and yeah, they, they would always, you would see them running back and forth, all of them. And well, Evan, we're about to make a video with Evan, (laughs) your your older one. He's your oldest man. Oldest boy. Boy. And uh, we had a blast when we went into the cave in Arkansas. Uh huh. And uh, that, that's so much fun. But they definitely have their fun. And you know, uh, we always have family that we wish they were in the right spot. And, and sometimes uh, I, I always say, you know, uh, leave the judgment to God because only God knows what's going on. But definitely we can pray for them. You know, and that's what I do. Because I, I know. With the letters, Mm -hmm. the letters, she had kept all the letters between the two of them. And he was apparently a very good Catholic. So I think he made all his, you know, first Fridays and Saturdays and was very devout. So I do believe in the end, he'll come back. He he really like admires Father Dominic and, you Mm -hmm. know, he he's questioned things, but he's so deep in that if he were to try to get out, I don't know if he could at this point, Mm -hmm. but I, you know, pray for him every day that, you know, in the end, he will do the right thing. But it was that is that is the worst part with those things. I was talking to someone, uh, and I mentioned this in one of the classes that this was a man that joined uh, Freemasonry because that way you would get uh, free drinks in the bar. <laughs> I was like, no. Uh, but a lot of people get into that, and they get a lot of benefits, and they get a lot of connections, and then it's really hard. That's exactly what he did it for. Really hard to get up. He did. He, he wanted those connections to get up politically, and mm. it did. It got him in there. He was mayor of his town for many years, and mm. he uh, does a lot politically uh, mm. where he is and helps other people do it. And 
Um, I'm glad because he had asked me when I was younger about like becoming part of like Jehovah's daughters and things. And, you know, I think God was protecting me the whole time that I mm-hmm. had no interest in that lifestyle because he, he did try to influence me mm-hmm. in many ways. Uh, and it was, I was grateful and it was a lot of like that influence and with other family, why we, we decided to leave. California and Bishop was always talking to us every time he came out Mm -hmm. he would be uh we'd be questioning kind of because Xavier was like no we're never leaving California he was adamant Mm -hmm. (laughs) it was always going to be California I'm like we need to go this is just it's gotten so bad and um what year was this this would have been oh gosh Evan was just a baby so he's 20, so that was about 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah, about 20 years ago. It wasn't too bad back then. <laughs> it was, it was still, to <laughs> yeah, it was, it was still really bad right then. Because, yeah, you know, and Father Dominic had told me, you know, we talked about homeschooling. And mm-hmm. um, he, you know, I was trying so, so hard to try to do all those things. But my oldest um was very ornery and and then Evan would fall in line with what she did and then he'd get himself into trouble and then I was pregnant with the third one and I was like I can't you know this is getting too too hard for me to try to to stay focused no matter how hard I was trying I was I was doing my best but there was no way in the schools there that was the very first time like the city right next to us the Supreme Court said parents have no exclusive right to teach their children about sexual Mm -hmm. things they were passing out to third graders a sexual survey, and that was in the town right next to us. I'm like, there's no way I could put my kids in the school. So we just kept praying, and, and every time Bishop would come out during confirmations, we're like, okay, we're thinking about moving. And he's like, we're thinking about going to the Mount. And he was like, come to, to Omaha. He always wants everybody in Omaha. And he's like, come there, you know, got, you got to get out there. And so we just kind of kept thinking about it, you know, and every year we're like, we don't know how we're going to be able to do this. And you know, the God does things in mysterious ways part. Mm -hmm. Um, We wouldn't have kind of made that leap if it wasn't for the last house we had bought was um, right during, before the the housing bubble burst Mm -hmm. in California. And at that point, our mortgage was more than what we were paying now. And it was, Xavier was going through schooling and so I was the only working, I could not support a family, a, you know, with my mother, my mom was staying there, you know, and then plus the three kids. And mm-hmm. so we ended up, we just couldn't, Our we were so under in our house. And so we ended up losing our house. And so we're like, okay, we'll go, we'll go to Omaha. Mm-hmm. You know, we decided we're going to make that, that trip that we're going to do this. So we put everything into a storage trailer on my dad's property. Mm-hmm. And um, we we said, okay, we're going to spend six months, a little bit of time with my my dad. He had a house out in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And um, he, so this wasn't his main house. His main house was in L.A. And so we're like, okay, we'll come out there. And uh, before we go out to Omaha, spend a little bit of time, save up some money because we wouldn't have to worry about paying anything. Mm-hmm. And then head out. Well, as soon as we ended up out there, six months turned into two years. Um the car we had broke down and Xavier had to commute. We were out in the middle of the high desert, three hours away. He was commuting to the beach. So he was gone all week. I was at home, there um, at the ranch with the three little ones out in the desert. There was no heat, no air conditioning. Um, we had scorpions in the house. We had, I mean, it, there's a whole story with that. The guy who was taking care of the property, there's animals. He had, it was a horse ranch and um, mm-hmm. the guy who was taking care of the animals, he was, I don't know, bipolar or something. He would talk to himself and talk about killing me, you know, while he was Yikes. talking. I mean, yeah, it was, I mean, it was a nightmare living out there. And I, I mean, the first day we moved out there, I cried. <laughs> I don't know for how long. And um, so we ended up there for two years. And finally, I ended up expecting our fourth child. And I told Xavier, I said, I'm not having this baby here. We are not going to do this. I go, you're going to go. Uh, well, right before that, we had gone because we wanted to check it out. No, we, yeah, we'd gone out there right before that, checked it out. We knew it. And then, so at that point, I was probably about like, I was about four months pregnant when we checked it out and we felt, we were like, yes, this is for sure what we want to do. Um, 
came back and I told Xavier, I said, that's it. You're going to go out there. You're going to find a job. I go, I'm not having this baby here. And I literally, I said, go, you know, and I kicked him out. I'm like, you're going to go and, and get work. And so Bishop took him in, had him staying. It was right about this time, actually, in uh, 2010, because uh, mm -hmm. the priest meeting, I think, was going on okay. right then. And he stayed, um, he stayed with a parishioner out there for a short time and then was at the uh, seminary and was staying there. And so he got the influence from what priests were there and he he really enjoyed it and so every day he would just look for work and um school was getting ready to start and at that point i was nine months pregnant and yeah. i'm like this is it i'm not not doing this. you know I'm not gonna have this kid and i usually i had pre normally had preterm labor so mm -hmm. i was like you know really worried my first was at 35 weeks i was concerned and um so we had, uh, at that point, here I am trying to load up a tr the rest of our stuff onto this trailer. I'm like, we we're coming out of here no matter what. We're getting out of here. And all I had was a small minivan. And mm -hmm. I packed up what I could, like important papers, the computer. Then I put a baby car seat in case I had the baby on the road. <laughs> and I was like, just in case. And I put a baby car seat and a little pack and play type of thing. And that was what we came to Omaha with and just, just the van and that stuff just the van and that stuff what what I had there and and I in an emergency pregnancy kit in case <laughs> in case I gave birth on the road wow. and my oldest was uh I think 11 at the time and I told her okay this is what you're gonna do if mom goes and has a baby you know I go this is how we're gonna do it and that's what she was you know she had that little emergency kit in case something happened wow. and I got the okay from my doctor and he says it doesn't look like you're gonna go anywhere you know right now and I'm like all right you know like as far as having a baby and literally got on the road and I drove I drove straight through mm -hmm. to to Omaha and I arrived the weekend before school started and um we, uh, it, it, at that point, Xavier had gotten his first job and it was like paying like something ridiculously low and not enough to support a family, and, but it was something he just got to get us going. And so he's like, okay, he goes, I've been here and I've been praying. He goes, I've been lighting candles to St. Joseph. And he says, and I asked St. Joseph if, you know, this is, um, you know, help us out that we need this help. I need you. He goes, these are the things. And he says, at first it wasn't working because he was there for maybe, I think it was like a month or two that he mm. was there on his own. And at first, you know, he was asking nicely for job and for this. And he goes, and it wasn't happening. And he kept asking St. Saint Joseph. And he said, finally, he goes, I switched over to the Blessed Mother. And he goes, all right, here's the deal. I need you to get him working for us. He goes, we need something and we need it now. I need you to get him to do this for us. And he goes, and I promise, he goes, you got to get us, he goes, you got to get me a job. And he was just, he goes, I put it very straightforward. He goes, I need a job and enough to support the family. He goes, I need a place for us to live. Mm -hmm. And he goes, get us a place. He goes, and I promise St. Joseph, he goes, I'll find a place right when you open the door that you'll be in a place of prominence, you know, he goes, but you're going to have to support, you know, you're going to have to find a way to get your statue to me. Because, you know, to put you there, because because we don't have the money and we don't have a statue with us because <laughs> I was just taking what was in the car. So and Joseph is probably thinking like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> it was everything. It, he was like, you know, I need this. And he goes, and I need, you know, and he had like this whole lineup of things. OK, you're going to have to mm -hmm. but you're going to have to supply this. You're going to have to supply that. And so he went with that. And so we were driving out weekend before school. I'm like, all right, I have to go, you know, get these things. I'm worried any moment I could be having this baby and get the kids in there and we stayed with a person at at church for the first um two weeks and they're like well you're gonna have to go and we're like we don't even have a place to live and so we just he, he, xavier you know was out there and he's like he's gonna supply he you know this is gonna come through mm -hmm. so sure enough right when uh that time we stayed with another person everybody knows out there that everybody stays with <laughs> at mm -hmm. one point or time. I know who it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we were staying with there and we were the one, we, we got the one notoriety of having a baby while staying at his house. Oh, wow. And um, so we stayed with him for, uh, it was about two weeks at that point and we're just praying adamantly. And then I, I went to a doctor and I'm like, 
this baby, you know, I go, I'm worried because this place is out further from Omaha. I go, I'm not going to make it into the hospital. So they went ahead and um, uh, got everything started so I could have the baby, brought home the baby to, you know, someone at another parishioner's house. And uh, we're like, okay, we've got to, you know, get something moving. So then suddenly this place turns up for rent that we find uh, Bishop helped us with the, these rental things and mm-hmm. we went ahead and we found this one and we're like, okay, this is it. We can afford this. And Xavier's like, we're getting any more money. Please, you know, supply us with more money. Right. As soon as we got this place, he, he put full confidence. I could not believe how confident he was. And it was like within that time, he got like a $2 an hour raise, which helped it to be able to afford to move into this place. Mm-hmm. Then we get, to, we see this place and, um, Right when you open the door and you look straight in, there's an alcove that was right there when you open it. And he's like, that is perfect for St. Joseph. And he's like, but we don't have one. And we go to move in. And I kid you not, another person from church goes, oh, we know you don't have much. Here, do you want a a statue of St. Joseph? And oh wow! Like, no way! And it was like the perfect size for that alcove. He fit yeah. right in there, and we're like, "Okay, thank you." You know, we're like, "This is we're doing apparently what you know our Lord is saying." You know that here it was the alcove, and he fit right in there. And she goes, "And here, I brought you some pots and pans, and I brought you this, and and we're like, it was exactly what we needed mm-hmm. in order to get started because we literally, I mean, just." nothing. And so, you know, here I am brand new, never lived outside of California, had nothing, you know, to it. And it was like, all of a sudden these things just started coming in and Mm -hmm. being provided for us. And, you know, she brought beautiful big rosary for the wall and, you know, these statues. And it was just, it, it amazed me Mm -hmm. how everything ended up, you know, turning out. And I was like, okay, you know, as scared as I was, to do this and with a newborn and, and dealing with all this, it, it, we didn't really feel like we had to deal without and it, and it happened. And so it was six months later, the owners of the property needed to take it back. Um, so we only had a six month lease. So they kicked us out and it was like, then the next, we ended up back at that house again, the other one that Mm -hmm. everybody stays at. Um, he, he welcomed us right back for a short time until we got another place. And, um, And then we just, you know, kept praying. And it was like every, we had to go through these little struggles, but we would just pray. And then the next thing would happen. And, and that was the biggest thing was just how my family, like my children, I don't understand. Cause we want to, I'm like, I cannot have my children gaining those roots in California where they're like, they don't want to move. I'm like, we have to do it now because they were still young. That's a very good point, yeah. Because once 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 you get settled in a in a place, it's very hard to 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 move and not and not acquire the culture of the place. Mm-hmm. Because we were talking about that before the show, but it's true. It, there is some truth to that. That where you live, you acquire that culture. You see it every day. You hear the the words that they say. You hear uh, uh, you see the fashions. You see their interests, their trending things, and and you do get that for sure. Yeah. So that was a good decision. Yeah, um, we, so. we, you know, we, I, I've tried explaining to them. All, most all my kids understand, you know, what, when I tell them, because I try to remind them mm-hmm. that it wasn't a fly-by-night decision. There was a whole reason mm-hmm. we did this. And we sacrificed everything. I mean, we left literally everything behind. Eventually, some of our stuff came, um, but... It was 90% of our, our things, mm-hmm. you know, were left behind that we gave up. I mean, I literally just, if I had what was in that van, then that was all, you know, I was okay with, you know, mm-hmm. that we, we would have just this because I was willing to do that because it was that important at that point to make sure we were out of that yeah. environment. Something that comes up with you with all the stuff that you're mentioning also is how important it is for parishioners to to help out and be charitable to other people and and because mm-hmm. that makes such a big difference and it's something that thankfully uh i've been surprised to see how 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 that works 
you know, at least in the parishes that I've that I know I've known, where people help each other out, and you see them like really jumping out, like this person that you're talking about that has hosted basically everyone in the country. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you see his fridge, and he has all these pictures of all these these people. But but it's surprising to see how people go and and when someone has a need, they go and uh, out of their way to help out. And I think I, I do want to mention that because I think the people that don't most of the times is just because it doesn't cross their mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was there. I was there where it's like, you don't really think about, you know, they might accept your help. They might appreciate your help. You know, they might be seeking for it or, 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 or even waiting for it. And a lot of times you think like, well, they're not going to, you know, accept it. They might be embarrassed if I offer to help or something. And it's like, no, I mean, it's a family. And I always tell that to the people in my parish. It's like, we're a family. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we have to help each other out. And when there are problems, which there will be, because, you know, in a, you we're human beings. We just jump up over the bump and and keep going. And that that is a, that can be any further from the truth. These are could be more of the truth of it, because all of our family is, you know, extended families in California. We mm -hmm. don't have I mean, it's my family unit that's here. And so we don't have other people to count on. And it was like, you know, we didn't want that negative influence from like my father and, you know, other things, you know, visiting's fine, <laughs> but mm -hmm. not an everyday influence. Well, you're trying but, to raise your children Catholic <clears throat> and you want to have yeah. a Catholic influence. Yeah. Exactly. And so out here, this, it, that has become my family unit as far as, you know, anyone else, in my, my friends, my family, you know, everything has to be within the church because I don't want any other influence from outside coming in, mm -hmm. but it is imperative you know, they, they did, they helped out. Like when they saw that need, when we moved here, mm -hmm. they helped out. We had that Bishop was like, you know, okay, what can I help with here? What can I help with there? And it did. And, and, you know, Bishop kind of does, he's a crutch for the beginning, kind of helping people get started. But then, you know, he lets that, you know, you gotta, gotta get on your own. Mm -hmm. And, but it was, it helped feel, make me feel at least secure that I knew, okay, I have a backup. That was my yeah. hardest thing was not knowing you know, I was leaving my parents and, you know, all, all my, I mean, I've got a huge extended family out there, a hundred plus people up, you know, just on my, my father's side mm -hmm. to know that I'm not right there where I can have, if I fall or, you know, have that help. Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of scary, you know, being out here, but it needs to be reminded at the same point, even though I had a huge amount of help when we first came here, when I was down with cancer, uh, I don't think because I wasn't around mm -hmm. as much because I had to disconnect myself because I wasn't in the health. I didn't have any health to be, you know, talking with the ladies and doing things. And, you know, at the very beginning, they were like bringing, they, they had brought over a few meals. But then it was like because I wasn't being seen, I and especially once they heard I was out of chemo, I think they kind of thought, oh, she's, she's, she's good. Yeah, yeah, she's good. And it actually wasn't. It, the chemo knocked me down, but the, it got even worse once I hit radiation. Mm -hmm. And that was extremely difficult getting through because it just, it, it, I was already down, but then that just kind of like, you know, slammed mm -hmm. me down even harder going through that. And at that point, there was no one asking, Xavier, do you need help? Do you need help with the kids? Do you need help doing anything? Mm -hmm. You know, no one saying, hey, you know, I'll go with you to the doctor's appointment, you know, or go with you, sit with you when you have to sit there for six hours and get, mm -hmm. you know, IV fluids. And so, you know, and I just, I wasn't well enough to, to speak out. And I, and I don't think well, I wanted to, to ask. That's, that's the thing is what I'm saying that sometimes it's like, uh, you don't realize and people are not going to mm -hmm. ask sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, it's so important to keep track on them. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is that I'm sure most people want to help, mm -hmm. but you know, you don't think about it. You don't think of whether if they, they are needing it, as you say, you don't see them perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what I figured. I, I never thought anything malicious. They're, they're ignoring me or anything like that. It was just, I thought out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Right after um, I was just going through radiation and while I was being radiated, the radiation was on my neck and it, it gave me third degree burns, you know, and I had to wear like a special scarf on me that had medication on it just to be mm -hmm. able to, you know, do things. It was really hard and, and I'm claustrophobic as it is. And 
And during radiation, they tied me down and I couldn't move. And I had this machine up against my face. It was very traumatic, the whole process. And, um, and I had to have this done, I think it was two times a week, you know, so it was, it was a, a lot of going through, but it really, that's when, uh, everything, you know, it hit my body. It, it was killing off parts of my body basically. And so I had already been where I should have already been hospitalized because I was so sick at one point. And anyways, it was right when I was getting to where I could just start kind of functioning as a human being again. And, but it was, everything was a huge, huge effort. And, um, so I was asked by one of the moms, you know, Hey, we're doing, you know, a thing at church, you know, come on out, you know, you don't have to worry. Cause I normally helped out with the event and she's like, just come out, you know, it'd be really nice to see you and be part of it. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I haven't done anything in months. So this was my first big kind of going out. And I was debating it as it was because I was very tired and very weak. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm at that point, I knew I could make it down the stairs to the basement. I knew I couldn't make it up, but I was I was heading down the stairs and uh, I had one of the moms come up to me and she and she goes, well, you know, hey, it's great to see you. How you doing? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, good. You know, I, I'm, I'm OK. You know, and I, it wasn't worth trying to go into what. I had been going through. There yeah. was no reason for it. And the mom goes in, I, I just to reciprocate and I go, Oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so exhausted. You wouldn't believe it. I'm so tired. I didn't get any sleep. And they went on and on. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, you know, it was great seeing you, you know. And and, and so I, I just, you know, kind of kept that in there and I walked down further. And I kid you not, another mom comes up to me. Same conversation repeats. And she, you know. I tell her the same thing, I'm, you know, I'm okay. And, and I'm struggling as it is to walk down these steps. It's just like, it's a, it was a huge effort. And I was like, I'm going to be able to last for maybe another 20 minutes and I'm gonna have to go home because mm -hmm. I just didn't have the strength. And this other mom comes up and she tells me, she's like, uh, I asked her how she's doing. She goes, oh, the, you know, I, and just went on about how exhausted they were. And I was like, okay, yeah, you know, and I realized they all thought, because I was done with the chemo, I was fine to them. You mm -hmm. know, the radiation, they had no idea the absolute effort. This happened three times, by the way, that mm -hmm. night, the same conversation with the different moms. And I just kind of kept it all there and thought it was such a learning experience for me mm -hmm. as far as these moms had zero concept of what effort it took for me to be there at that point and mm -hmm. how much of a struggle everything had been. And I think if I had been, if it had been a year earlier, I would have been in the same position they would have been where I would be like, oh, I'm exhausted. You know, my kids, they're just keeping me going and I'm, I'm just so tired. And at that point I couldn't even lift my leg to get into my tub. You know, it was just, it took all the effort and my, I, I, I didn't have that strength. And I thought, what a learning experience to know. We have no idea sometimes what people are going through and mm -hmm. the struggles that they're facing and that they're putting on a front just mm -hmm. to get through that. I'm just like it because it wasn't even worth the physical effort of explaining anything, you know, mm -hmm. on how it was such an effort for me to be there and be part of it. And that part, you know, the lessons that God teaches us. And I thought it really humbled me. To think, you know, I kind of get in my own little world, my own little bubble mm -hmm. of how I perceive things. And I realize these women had no, you know, idea of what I was going through, but I can be more conscientious in the future of other people and reaching out to them and realize, you know, hey, mm -hmm. you know, we don't, they, their perception of me was, I was okay. I was done with chemo. I'm okay. And then it was far from the truth, but in the future, I can be more conscientious of that. And I've done that. I've done that every time I hear, you know, like on the, the group chats, you know, someone's sick, pray for them. And I'm, I'm, you know, I text, Hey, how are they doing? How's it going? Because I know how hard that is when people think no one cares. Okay. Mm -hmm. No one cares. And it did change me because I'm like, and I, I didn't think about it until just the other day again about when I was doing that with somebody and they're like, you know, Hey, I appreciate you keep checking in. And I've had that mm -hmm. with a couple of people 
And you know, that I appreciate that you keep checking in with me and seeing how I'm doing. And I'm like, and I, I it's become second nature to me. I, I don't even, yeah. don't even think about it anymore. And I'm like, why wouldn't I? That's something that uh, I learned from my father, actually, because my dad also, he suffered a lot as well. And as you say, uh, he suffered things that people would not be able to notice. And so from there, he learned the same lesson, I would say. And, and it always, it always, um, he was notorious to me how he would always be careful of going to visit people that were home ridden, people that nobody knows or remembers about. Mm -hmm. And I remember this vividly from when we were like in Christmas or, or, you know, visiting another town and me as a child, I would go with him to the house of this person. And as a child, you know, you don't care about it. As a child, mm -hmm. you're like, why are we here? I'm bored. I'm just sitting here in the living room while they're talking. Now that I'm a grown up, and here's the importance of doing that with the children too, because now that I'm a grown up, I remember and I see, wow, it was like this, you know, old guy or old lady that nobody knew about, that few people took care of them, nobody visited them, and my dad would go call yeah. them, check on them, you know, ask what they need on Christmas, go and visit them and bring them uh, letters and stuff. I want to finish uh, by asking you uh, three questions that I always ask to, to the people that we uh, interview. I should have warned you about these questions before. It's going to be a trick question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the first one is, uh, I'll tell you the three of them so that you kind of get the context. The first one is, what do you think was the greatest challenge in all this trip, in all this journey? You know, what? What was perhaps the greatest difficulty that you had to face? The other one is the greatest blessing. What was the greatest uh, joy that you had, uh, especially once you found the faith? And the third one is, what is the advice that you give to youth? Not just to the children, but, but to everyone that is listening to this, that perhaps people that perhaps didn't go through those fights, people that perhaps were born in the faith, they never had to find it. They didn't have those moments of, trying to search for it here and there and, and you know, uh, trying to read in books and trying to try different churches. They were just given it from the beginning and they might not appreciate it because of that, because they, they didn't they didn't get the thrill of finding the treasure. Mm -hmm. So the first one, uh, what do you think was the greatest challenge that you had to face? As far as finding my faith and being part of that? Just throughout the whole journey, you know, like uh, what what was... Well, let's put it like this. What was the greatest challenge of being a traditional Catholic, of being a Catholic, a real Catholic? Mm. So you're talking about after I figured out Fridays, I can't eat meat. <laughs> that had been the biggest challenge at first <laughs> on that. Um, I think the biggest challenge is um, going up against the world because we're so far from what the world is today. Mm -hmm. Everything is so counter. We're considered haters because we have faith and we have standards. And I've dealt with that many times with friends that would all of a sudden wouldn't want to be friends because they said I was judging because I just wouldn't do certain things mm -hmm. that they would and that were out of the faith. These are friends out of the faith. And it was really um, difficult to, to be against what the flow mm -hmm. is. And especially in today's time, you know, of everything going on and just keeping it going, going forward. That has to be mm -hmm. the hardest thing. Of course, it does make it easier being here in Omaha and having <laughs> yeah. the sisters and all the religious, because at least my children see it and it, it's and keeping them out of the outer world that they definitely get more of that here. They have a social circle. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. it's just normal to them. Yeah. As opposed to what I know and I see in the outside and try to shelter them from yeah. to not get that. And that is a huge blessing. It you have to have the school, the social circle, the friends, the other families to, to hang with. What, well, we kind of answered that, but what do you think would be the greatest blessing that you have had since you found the faith? <laughs> yeah, having that. <laughs> Having that, no, you know, it's that the focus definitely of the faith that I'm not lost anymore. And there was, mm -hmm. I mean, I spent years, my, you know, the first 19 years of my life lost, not knowing, knowing there was something out there, but not knowing what it was. 
-hmm. And one's finding it to have that reassurance, to have that comfort. And even though all the crosses, all the horrible, horrible times, everything that's happened, that I haven't lost that. And I still know that this is the true one. Mm -hmm. And I keep that in the back of my mind at all times is, man, every person, it wasn't, you know, the Catholic faith, or the faith, our Catholic faith wasn't created by this man or that man. It was by our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're a Christian, you can't deny it. And so that reassures me that's a blessing because that holds me through everything of knowing mm -hmm. there's no question. This is the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that was said by a generic book. <laughs> <laughs> Not a Catholic book. Exactly. <laughs> You know, what advice what advice would you give to to our young young listeners um with that i had an idea in my head when you first asked me i uh, trying to remember on that one um for the young ones elaborate again on what you said with the question because maybe bring it back right to me that uh you know, it's important because they didn't have to go through the struggle of finding the faith. They didn't have to go through sometimes the struggles with the family, the opposition of the family. So what I always tell people is, is for them, it's not their fight. Mm -hmm. It was given to them. It's like my mom put me here in this church where they speak Latin. And, and you know, I go to here because they told me to. But uh, And yes, I know it's true. And they've told me the classes and everything. But they don't have that. When you're robbed of something, you fight for it with much more, more passion. Mm -hmm. You know, when you know that it costs you blood, so to speak, you know, for example, your house, you pray for your house for eight years. So now it's like, this is my house, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you're not going to touch it. Uh, so as opposed to if, for example, someone gives you your house, you don't care about it. So that's kind of the sense of this question, you know, how do you bring that to the, ch to the young people? What, what advice do you give to them? If, if you could pass them an idea, a feeling, uh, uh, a passion, how would you pass it? To the and I remember, words? okay, I remember what it was, and that has to deal with, um, and I've talked to my children about that, uh, you know, kind of touched on with the way he would say, you know, put me down. Mm -hmm. about it and he, I remember sitting in the, in the car arguing with him and he said he goes you know look at where you are and look at where I am mm -hmm. and all that I have and he's talking about his material things he goes look at all I have and he goes and what if you're wrong he goes what if there is no God what if there is nothing in the end and I I, and I couldn't believe he even said that and I looked at him and I said I go what if I am? I go, am I living a worse life? Am I, am I doing anything that's bad? Or am I bettering myself? No matter what, it, you know, taking your perspective, if there's no God, mm -hmm. am I a better person or a worse person because of the way I live my life? Mm -hmm. And he had no answer to it because he couldn't, you know, I, I live by the faith, what the church teaches and try to be a better place. I don't, I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't do these things. I mean, he would walk over someone to get to something that he wants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I have the reassurance that I am in the right place. I've had so many miracles, definitely mm -hmm. all the miracles in my life to know, but to argue with somebody outside of the faith, it, it brings everything. You, you realize no matter what, you're still, you're winning comparatively mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. And yeah. I'm, I'm grateful for that. And that is, I think that is the big difference between, one of the big differences between the Catholic religion, the true religion and the false ones. And, and St. Ignatius, Ignatius of Loyola actually mentions that. He says, in order to have good, it has to come from God. It has to come from God. If, if the, devil, the devil tries to imitate good, you know, he'll, for example, if a person is uh, involved in the Shriners or all those places, and they'll be very charitable, mm -hmm. quote unquote. Uh, but in every good that the devil does, there's always something wicked. There's always some, something that is going to be not right. You know, you, you can be a very good person in all these aspects, but then you'll be falling in this one. And that's just unavoidable. In every yeah. false religion, 
you have that where it's like, oh, look at that. They believe in Jesus and look at that. They believe in the resurrection and they believe in this, but they don't believe Jesus when he talks to us about the Virgin Mary or they allow divorce or they allow, mm -hmm. you know, multiple wives. <laughs> so it's like there's always something where just it just everything falls apart. Yeah, you got to take it all. If the church, the true church, what it teaches, you can't yeah. pick and choose. You got to yeah. you got to accept it all. And that to me, what you were mentioning, I was just talking to the previous person about that, what you just said, that when you have someone that doesn't believe in religion, uh, I always take the approach of philosophy and tell them, okay, find me a better philosophy for life. Mm -hmm. Find me one philosophy that, that guarantees to me morality in every way, a peaceful life in every way, a wife that is going to be, uh, you know, uh, supportive, loyal, faithful to me, uh, children that are going to be obedient to the, mm -hmm. uh, to the father, that the father is going to be pushed and, and, and promoted to fidelity, to being, you know, as your husband was, supportive in difficulties, to not just get divorced when things get difficult. Find me a philosophy of life that gives me all of those things. Exactly. There's only one. Only and that's one. the way I try telling them is yeah. this is, even in your, you know, your, your view is I'm, I'm, there's, you're not believing you're going to have to answer to God. Mm -hmm. Where is my life offensive? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm living my life so much better, which I want to put, a, I didn't get a chance to say, but I'd like to add in um, one, uh, you know, when you, you, people that don't believe, no, I, I, I think he truly does. He just wants to deny it. But um, one miracle that we did have, uh, we've had many, but the one of the big ones that's undeniable mm -hmm. was um, Xavier when his kidneys failed and um, he had uh, he was in complete failure and he was just getting ready to go in to the doctors to get a ultrasound to get a fistula put in to be on dialysis and he was um, uh, his kidney he has an inherited kidney problem which Evan has the same kidney disease uh, and so we knew he was going to have to have a transplant and, um, he was on the transplant list and on the very bottom, you couldn't be any lower than he was. Mm -hmm. It was like, I think 65 to 70 some odd thousand people on this list at that point, mm -hmm. he was on the very bottom and he wasn't accumulating any time. So when a person gets on the list, the worse off you are, or if you've been on dialysis for many years, you get up on that list higher and higher and they go from the top of the list on down. Mm -hmm. And um, he was at the very bottom, not getting up accumulating time because he wasn't on dialysis yet. Mm -hmm. And so we'd been praying and praying. And one night we get a phone call that this was right before Hurricane Katrina hit. And um, a young man in his early twenties was being taken off of life support and they had a kidney. And at that point, Xavier's brother was going to be donating one. And they called and they said, we have a kidney for, for him if you want to take it. And Xavier's like, well, my brother was going to do it. And they're like, no, you don't understand. This one couldn't match you any more perfect unless it was your identical twin. This kidney is, he, they had said, the criteria each one had to match. In order for him on the very bottom of the list to even be considered, that meant say 64,000 were on the list. That meant 64,000 people didn't match this kidney as well as he did. That he wow. was the only one out of that list that matched perfectly comparatively. And he went in that night and got his, his new kidney. And we asked the doctor because he wasn't accumulating time that out of 64,000 people, there was no one else a better match that all these things hit. And we said, what were the chances? And the doctor looked at him and goes, there weren't any. He goes, I've never once in my life seen this. He goes, and he alluded to this was a miracle. He said, there's no one he's ever heard of that was at the very bottom of the list that got a kidney because it fit that person perfectly. And wow. we were elated. That was a true miracle because mm -hmm. we've been praying for it as long as his kidneys were starting to fail. And it's been it was right before Katrina and it was right in the city that it came from. And that would have, if it had been, I think three or four days later, he wouldn't have gotten that kidney. And it just mm -hmm. so happened. That's when they pulled that person off, unfortunately, but they donated everything and he ended up with it. And it's been 18 years that he's had that kidney and never had a problem. 
Wow. So it was a, a true miracle on that one. Mm -hmm. So I thought a nice story of knowing. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much again for coming, for joining us. It's, it's, a, it's a sacrifice, I know, especially when, when uh, we had a little bit of technical difficulties beforehand. But uh, I really hope that this is going to help many people, I believe. And, and I always appreciate it. I always appreciate that sacrifice that, that we make in being oh, in front of the camera. Yes. Now in front of video, because before it was I just no, no, it was, before it was just a, mi a microphone, but now it's video, so no anonymity here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, exactly. Hopefully there's no hairs out of place. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate it. And, and we'll keep all, all the members of your family that need prayers, we'll keep them in our prayers as well. That's and we ask very appreciated. All our listeners to also keep them in their prayers, in their prayers. Thank you. This has been your host, Father Carlos Cepeda, for another episode of Back to the Faith. I'm joined by Angie, whom we really appreciate. You're listening to The Catholic Wire. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Wire. If you have found this show helpful, please say a prayer for all our collaborators. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels and share with your friends. For questions and comments, you may contact us at thecatholicwire.org.